Jens Mør Pedersen. I'm professor at Aalborg University, uh, teaching uh, cybersecurity, our cybersecurity master program, IT West, uh, continuing education programs and so on. And then I'm also a coach for the Danish national cybersecurity team. How many of you know uh, Cyberland Solid? Nice, nice, nice. Uh, because part of what we want is actually that the young people know more about security uh, and uh, develop their competences and the national team is a uh, part of that. And my talk today, I will switch a little bit between talking capture the flag and learning and talking about the national team and the training and the Danish uh, cyber security championships because I think they can really, it really complements each other in a good way. So if we start with um, the championships, uh, those of you who know the Danish national cybersecurity team, you probably also know that the team won the European Cybersecurity Challenge last year as the first small country to ever win this competition. And, and this is a picture from the stage. Uh, ECSC is the European Cybersecurity Challenge. Uh, in 2022, there were participants of 33 countries, uh, 28 European countries and five guest countries. And the guest countries were countries like the US, Canada, Israel, Serbia, and UAE. Uh, I usually say that uh, this demonstrates that the Danish team is not only the best in Europe, but it's actually the best in the world because of those competitors. And uh, each team consists of five juniors, juniors that's 15 till 20, seniors, uh, also five seniors, age 21 till 25. Um, I will come back to, uh, to this later because I think that the way of playing capture the flag, the way of using this hacker mindset, it's, it shouldn't only be for those uh, young people, but for also for the rest of us, we can learn a lot during this way of working. Uh, the competition is actually a two-day competition. Um, on day one, which is the Wednesday, it's a classical capture the flag competition, which I will explain in a bit. You solve challenges, you get points, you have a scoreboard, those who get the most points win the competition. And then the, the, on day two is an attack defense day where every team is getting uh, different services, which has some vulnerabilities. And then you have to defend, you can say your own systems. You have to patch the vulnerabilities, you have to find the vulnerabilities. You have to patch them. And at the same time, you have to attack the other teams, which have the same systems with the same vulnerabilities. And I know that this talk is being recorded, so I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of giving out too many hints here because you also have a competition this year. But one of the strategies you actually use in the attack defense part is that you listen to, you see how are you being attacked, and then you become very good and very fast in replicating those attacks and sending them to, to everyone else. Uh, but uh, one of the cool things was that Denmark won actually both categories here. When you are at the competition, will you have a scoreboard each day, uh, where you can see how many points the different teams have. But the last hour, the scoreboard is being closed. And that means that you don't know uh, exactly who won the first day and you don't know exactly who won on the second day. Uh, but you have a pretty good idea about it because you know the status one hour before. And uh, it turned out that Denmark actually won both categories here. Before looking at the slides, I will just say that um, if we look at the Danish progress here, we have been part of this competition since 2017. And if we look from 2018 and from there, uh, we had a 13th place, we had a 9th place, we had a 5th place. So it was with very big expectations we participated last year uh, to continue this nice, this nice curve. Uh, and um, what happens was that when you, before you enter the stage, they announce first the 23 countries, which doesn't get a medal, uh, or who's not in top five. They come up to the stage, they get a medal, they go down again. And they're saying five countries. And then they say, who is number five? Who is number four? And then they announce that among the last three countries, Denmark was not mentioned so far, but they're saying among the last three countries, it was really, really close. Then they say number three, is France, and it's really exciting. And they're saying number two was Germany, and then the Danish team just cannot be stopped. Uh, and of course, the last uh, team to be named is the Danish team, which won the competition. 
And what happens is that before we we move on to we get onto a stage, uh, we are invited to a stage, and we are, and he's saying among the last three countries, it was really really close. But when we go up to a stage, he takes down the microphone, and he said, it actually wasn't close. And uh, this is the point. Uh, so Denmark uh, did a really really uh, good job, uh, both day one and day two, and. Uh, I think it's a success story that a small country like Denmark can do like this. Uh, we are competing. If you look at the other countries in top five, it's Germany, it's France, it's Italy, it's Poland. It's really big countries. So that a small country with a small population that we are able to do, uh, that we have, okay, only the team deserves the honor for what they did. Uh, all credit to them. But I think that it's, it demonstrates that we can do something with the community building in Denmark and that we actually, when we are working together with uh, industry, with, uh, with the authorities, with the universities, then we can actually cultivate uh, something really big. Um, the, the journey to get to Saberland Toll is um, a rather long one. So we have online training days in February, March. Then that leads to an online qualification. Last year we had, or this year, we had 800 people uh, participating in the qualifications. We had 2,000 people signing up for online trainings. And that means that it's not only about the 10 on the national team, it's actually a large group of young people who are competing. Um, 400 qualified and made it to the regional championships, which were held in all the regions. And from there, the 100 best are selected. It's like top five in every age category in every region. region. And then we also take top 25 overall in each age category. Uh, and those 100 make it to the finals, which we just held uh, here in, in, um, in May. So it's a competition where we try to make it fun, both for the beginners and for those who are very experienced. Yeah. Um, what... What I really like about this is also that it's a super fun way of learning. And the CTF style, it's gamification because you're competing, you're getting points for what you do. And believe me, you will be amazed with what, what people can do when they get points for it. We have, like in our system, we have one challenge which we call uh, beginner Linux. And now I know many of you are developers, right? So you know a little bit of Linux. And the challenges we give people is... Uh, uh, list the files in a, a login with SSH and list the files in a directory. The next challenge is uh, try to uh, list hidden files. The next one is to move a file and to copy a file and so on. And you will see adult people. You will see people in their forces fighting. How do you do this? Because you get points for it. Um, so gamification is really strong. It motivates creativity and problem solving because often it... it um, you have to find the holes, you have to find the vulnerabilities, you have to find the way to make systems behave in a specific way. And I think for many of us who are working with IT, this is, at least for me, this is what I found was fun when I was 10 years old. So it's really coming back to the part of IT that I found to be fun, the, the, the creative process around it, the hacker mindset. Um, it's about collaboration. When we are training the national team, of course it's about having skilled people but it's also very much about having skilled people who are able to work together. So it's not only training individual technical skills, you also build a good collaboration. It's about thinking out of the box, learning about vulnerabilities, and then it's practical and hands-on. I was a little bit skeptical about the talk here because a 50-minute talk, yeah, I remember university, okay? I remember sitting in, in auditoriums because I felt I had to be there because I felt that as a good student, I had to be there. But honestly, where I learned was when there was the hands-on involved, when you were able to do things. And where I really learned was in the mix of learning some theory and then be able to apply it, but please not more than 30 minutes of theory before getting my hands on it. And I think that for many of us, we are actually learning better in this way. We also have science behind that. Um, so coming from the national team, the question is, why should this only be 
for young people, why should it only be something you do in your spare time? And I think that you can actually use this a lot, even for professional education, for continuing education, for education in master programs, for teaching high school students. I think this is a concept that can, uh, that, or it is a concept that can really be applied broadly. So what is capture the flag? Um, the basic idea is that it's a competition. I'm usually saying when we're using it for teaching that this is made for competition, but it's a competition where we are all winners because when we are learning more about cybersecurity, the world is becoming a more secure place and then we are all winners. Not everyone buys it though. Uh, where every time you get a flag, you also get a number of points. Uh, you can follow the teams on the scoreboards. This is an old one. Uh, and usually the one with the most points will be winning. So that's a basic idea. What we have done at Alba University is that we have built what we call our Hawkins uh, Hacker Labs. And I have to say here, because this could sound a little bit like we are educating hackers. We are not. But it's very, it's, it's very good to understand how hackers are thinking and working in order to be able to make secure software or make secure systems. So training the hacker mindset doesn't mean that we are educating hackers. And I also, I didn't bring it today, but I have some good slides about the law and what you can do and what you cannot do. So here, just don't do anything you shouldn't do. Um, but the idea with the Hawkins Lab is where we came from. And it's, it's really nice uh, to give a presentation to people from IT because you will understand where we came from. The real story is that we wanted to promote cybersecurity for high school students. We went to high schools with student helpers and we brought with us virtual machines. And then we asked each student in a class to install VirtualBox and a couple of virtual machines. And then you could attack one virtual machine from the other one. How many of you have been working with the virtual machines? Okay. Uh, I guess you have an idea about how much time we spent setting up these environments. And unfortunately, we didn't spend so much time on hacking, but we became very good in finding out how to change the BIOS settings and so on, on all different kind of computers that those uh, students had. But we felt it was more fun to do hacking. So we thought, okay, instead of everyone having to install their own environment, why don't we make something that we can provide? And that's what we did with Hawkins. I'm sorry for the text here. Um, it says virtual lab with vulnerable computers and devices. But what we have here is that we have a user that could be anyone. Uh, on a laptop, desktop, whatever, as long as he or she has a web browser, can get access to a lab, and each person or each team has its own lab. The lab is running in our server. Uh, we spin up a virtual Kali Linux. Uh, Kali Linux is a Linux with a lot of uh, nice hacker tools or cybersecurity tools. Uh, and you can use those tools to attack all those vulnerable devices that we have set up. We Usually use it like you access it through a web browser because it means that we can go anywhere and we can do it with anyone without previous experience. If people are more experienced, they can also access it with a VPN and they can run their own Kelly and they can VPN into the lab. But it's a little, it, it requires a little bit more to set it up and use it. Um, and then we have over time, and I think it's really developed over the last four years, uh, developed it into a fully automated setup so I can choose if I'm the teacher, I can say, okay, I want these challenges to be included today, and then these are the machines that are there. We started out with five challenges. I think today we have almost 500. Um, if you choose them all at the same time, you will crash it. Uh, it is possible. To, but um, but, but uh, that means that we can really choose challenges that fit to the audience that we are working with. Yeah. Um, yeah, each challenge, and this is not only for Hogan, this is like a general thing for Capture the Flag. Each challenge will contain a description. And uh, so here it's about abusing your credentials. You get an idea about what you have to do, and then you can enter the flag here. Uh, and you have the scoreboard. And what I think, again, is really strong here is this is actually something we did like uh, a month ago. Uh, together with a company. I don't think you can see which company it is. I tried to check that there's no personal information leaked here. I don't think there is. But what you can see is that this event was actually supposed to finish at 5.30. So this is when we stopped. And then we always see 
that some people continue straight away, some people go home, they put the kids to sleep, and when the kids are sleeping at 10 o'clock, then it's time, <laughs> then it's time to do a little bit more. And I think that this picture is telling a lot about how motivating it is. Uh, that is not just something where you have to really pull yourself together to do it, or you have to read this page, and it's really hard to overcome to do, but that uh, you want to do it because you are triggering the curiosity and you're triggering this creativity. Uh, can I do it, and how can I do it? And this is so strong. Uh, how we are using this in teaching is that um, Usually integrated in, it can be done in different way, ways. One way is to so integrate it into, into courses where we have content which are very, like relevant to the lectures. So that can be, I'm teaching about cookies, and then I have a challenge here, which is dealing with cookies and how cookies are working. Uh, by the way, I also think that even if you're not teaching security, but just teaching how systems are working, the hacker mindset is still a very effective way of doing it because you get your hands on it. So when you really want to understand how a system is working, try to hack it. Um, we have been doing like one-day courses for companies with uh, focus on, for example, secure development or secure IT OT devices. We have doing, been doing specific events, for example, with Gunfast. We have been doing a lot together with them, uh, taking their developers on a boot camp for two days of hacking. We have been doing like loads of uh, workshops for both IT professionals together with uh, EDA, um, business people, high school students, and so on. But so we can use this in many different contexts. And I will go back to exactly how I like to integrate it in a bit. But uh, I thought that now I've been speaking for almost 20 minutes, so around halfway. So I would make a little break and show you what it, what it really is. Uh, I'm not sure any of you who have experience with Capture the Flag from before. Just a few? Okay, then I hope you will like it. Again, I'm, I'm demonstrating using it our platform because I think it's amazing what we have done. Uh, it's not because I'm selling something, it's open source, it's uh, freely available. Um, but... I think it's pretty cool, uh, but there are other platforms as well. So here, actually, if you want, you can go to go gotor.hawkins.com and you can play with it tonight if you want. Um, I have just registered, otherwise you have to do that. Uh, but then here I have a list of the teams. Right now, I'm the only team. Then I have the different challenges. And the one I would like to show you today is cookie session. How many of you know what a cookie is? Almost everyone, cool. Then, uh, then it, it will work well. And I actually have, I, I brought two challenges. One is the cookie one, and let's see that first, and then I will show you how uh, you can advance it a bit afterwards. And this is also a way that I like to use it in my teaching, would be to first do like an explanation of what is cookies. You know that already, so we can skip that part. The next is I would give a demo of how to, how to do a challenge. And then I would ask you to do a challenge more independently afterwards, Maybe one that is a little bit more difficult, or one that's quite similar to what we did. Um, when I open here, I can read that I've been employed at Cookie Factory. My credentials are username Amelia, password summer 1234. Uh, that's all I get to know. Here I need to understand a little bit explicitly, but I will tell you that uh, I really want to see if I can get access as an administrator to the website here. And we can, try to, uh, we can try to solve it together. So um, I will pick one of you to answer questions along the way. Ah, I will find a volunteer. Uh, to get access to the lab, I simply click Connect. And when I click Connect, I get into the, um, maybe I can do it like this. I get into my Kelly Linux in the browser. So this is like the virtual lab I showed before. This is the Kelly Linux in it. Uh, I will open my browser. I don't have any internet uh, access from here. So I cannot do anything harmful to anything. Um, and then I was told to go to cookiefactory.com. So I'll go to cookiefactory.com. Um, I log in as I'm told. Okay. If I was here the first time, maybe I would have to navigate the website. I log in as... Amelia, and then Summer, one, two, three, four. And I get inside here, cool. 
So now it's saying, welcome Amelia to the employees portal. Anyone have an idea how I could be, become someone else than Amelia? It may be given the title, given the topic. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, so I will go to inspect here. And I will go to the cookies. Now it's always, in, live demo is always interesting uh, to see if you can actually see something. Otherwise I will make it a little bit bigger here. So here I have, okay, maybe we made it a little bit simple for the, um, for the purpose. Uh, but I have, if you cannot read it, I have a session cookie where it's called user ID equals 11. So maybe I could try to what? Yeah? Yeah, one would be too easy. So if I was doing this like a demo, I wouldn't give the answer in the first go. So I would say, maybe I would try a different number. So I would try to say 10. And I would see that before I was Amelia. Oops. Now I'm Alicia. And if I try a different number, surprise, I will become someone different. So you, there was someone who had a very good idea of trying to use number one. Maybe as a mathematician, I would have tried number zero, but. The good thing is I can try different things, and this is very much what it's all about. Try to see if it works, and if it doesn't work, then try something else. And uh, for example, here, just changing it by one will give me a hint, yeah, it was at least a step in the right direction. And when I take the user ID equals one, then I get actually here my Hawkins flag, and I can Copy it, and I can go here and I can paste it. I submit it and I get my flag and it becomes green. And if I look at the teams now, I will see that I got my first point and I can see that it is actually here. And that's the beginning of the scoreboard, right? Um, so that that's, that's how it works. Then maybe after this, um, can I show you just a little bit more before going on with the talk? Um, and I know that I didn't know, when I prepared this, I didn't know that this session was going to be recorded. And I will check if we can remove this little part of the talk uh, before it's being published. Because what we like to do is, it's of course, Cookie Factory, nobody knows Cookie Factory. But we try to be inspired by things from reality. And sometimes you find interesting vulnerabilities and then we say, hey, can we do something here? So one of, the, um, one of the challenges we have made, which is like, if I was demoing how you could work with cookies here, then uh, that could be the demo. Then I would tell the students that then now try to solve this one, which we call Momos. And um, yeah, Momo is good at making butter bread, but not so good at making web shops. Can you get a discount? That's the challenge, huh? So let's try to go to momos.hkn. And I think here, I just need to confirm this. Uh, and I'm sorry the text is in Danish, but uh, you will understand it. Of the challenge here. Menu. And here I can order different things. I hope the website doesn't remind you too much of uh, real existing websites. But I could try to take a fish fillet here. Oh, and now I have to remember how to do it. Um, this is always the demo effect. Here I can see I have a fish fillet and it costs 50 Danish corner. I think most of our challenges are actually made by students. And sometimes there is a comment, for example, a comment to the cost of water in Danish restaurants. Uh, but here, how could I get a discount? Based on what I've seen, any ideas what I could check? Exactly. So um, I would go to check the storage again. And then there is actually a local storage here. And in my no local storage, I can see 
that here is my fish fillet. I can see the content of the fish fillet. And I can see, I think, the price of the fish fillet. The, the funny thing about cookies is that you can change them, huh? Especially if they're not encrypted, then they can be easy to change. So just for the fun of it, we could try to change. I really hope that we can cut this out. Um, I could try to change it to zero. And then I don't remember, maybe I have to refresh the page again. Yeah, maybe I have to refresh it. And then if I look at what I have, wow. Now I have a fish fillet for free, huh? And then I can go to pay and then I will actually have my Hawkins flag here that I can use again. And I will have my second point. And here we made it a little bit tricky. I'm not sure it was made on purpose that you actually cannot copy it. So we need to go and see the, the code here behind. Uh, and maybe I forgot one character. I will insert that. So here. And that's perfectly fine. And sometimes you can solve things in more than one way. Um, and that's cool. So I got one more flag, and now I can see here that I'm really starting to be in a in a mood. And this way of working, where we gradually start giving people something where you don't need tools, and then you can build out with something that is a bit more difficult, and you can start doing something where you actually need tooling. That's a way that I think works really, really well for using this for, for teaching. I could also show that um, we have actually been working a lot on creating challenges which are more easily accessible for, uh, for non-IT people. So we have created, and this is what we have here, we have created like a universe of social media. This is from our, I wouldn't say that it's similar to TikTok, we call it Peacock. Uh, but we have a Peacock, we have a friend space, we have a job space, we have a photo space. And there you have to do different stalking challenges, or you can find the barcodes that you can scan and, and so on. So again, trying to make it accessible, at least in the beginning, for people without a technical background. And then you can gradually build on top of it, and when people get familiar with the environment and with the hang of it, then they can work more. But that was the little demo I included. I hope it gave some idea. Yeah. This is the part I was most nervous about, was to get this PowerPoint back on. Yeah. So, with like Cookie Factory, we that would be one kind of progression uh, that I showed here uh, to do a real life. But we also have, uh, but this way of working with progression is actually nice. It could also be that you're working with, for example, a cross-site scripting, and then you make it more and more advanced. The challenges you make it could be in crypto as well that you can make more and more challenges. So in general, we really try to make challenges with this kind of progression, and why we have two similar challenges and then one that is more difficult. Um, oops. One formula that I feel works well when teaching is to divide the lecture and the day into themes with a clear path and progression. As I said, start without tools, uh, then start with learning one tool or method at a time, and uh, later on you can maybe combine it. For example, we have one challenge where you need to use uh, cookies in order to uh, to jump a queue. So you have a queuing system, you realize that the cookies can be used to get you the place in the queue. Um, that where the, that's where the cookies could lead us. At another progression could be with Wireshark and monitoring of network traffic. Then you could start uh, checking out what network traffic you have in the lab. You maybe could see that someone was logging into this page and you could do some cookie stealing and then you could combine the cookies um, knowledge with the knowledge of network monitoring and then you could solve a challenge in the end. And so you like build up by learning different components one at a time and then putting it all together. Um, yeah. 
Um, so one way of building it up would usually be for me uh, to introduce the concept and the theory behind the vulnerability on attack. That could be cross-site scripting. I just took an example here from an example that I've often used to explain what is cross-site scripting. So to explain the concept. Once you have explained the concept, I would give a demo. This is how cross-site scripting works. Then after giving the demo, I would let the students, participants, uh, solve one or more challenges on their own, and then wrap up the session by discussing then how can you avoid uh, this vulnerability, for example, when you're talking cross-site scripting, to make sure that you're using input validation uh, in all fields so that you cannot uh, inject scripts. That could be one example. I, always, I also think that working in smaller groups is always giving a good uh, learning because you uh, discuss with each other, you learn from each other, and it's also good, uh, good for the team building part. Um, when it comes to a national team, and I think we often think about when we are talking teaching and training, we often think about like technical skills. But if you want to have a good team and when you, if you want to work with security, it's also important to have a good um, team, it's what's called team, dy team dynamics and working well within the team. It's actually important that if you're in doubt about something that you can ask a colleague and say, hey, I'm not sure exactly if this is good. Could you take a look at it for me? And this is what we are doing a lot in the national team. Uh, and I think that this is also, yeah, what you can use CTF for. That's why I brought it here. So when we are using, um, when we are using team building on the national team, uh, some of the things that we are working on is, for example, how to communicate. Um, it's about roles. It's having a good start of a competition. Um, then it's about collaboration and asking for help. I think that's something that in almost every CTF style setting, also if it's a teaching, also if it's a lecture, then this collaboration and asking for help is uh, good to train. Um, it might sound easy to ask for help. Um, when we are working on the national team, maybe I have a guy on... Uh, oh, we also have girls, but we have more guys. <laughs> like, like the audience. Uh, but, uh, but let's say that I have a, a team member, a 17 year old, just made it to a national team, uh, trying to, uh, to solve the challenge that, that was assigned to him or her. Um, but he or, he or she doesn't really know what to do from here. Uh, lost, no clue what to do. It actually requires some courage to ask the really experienced 23 year olds how to do this. And you might think, hmm, I don't want to disclose. I'm, I mean, if I just made it to a national team, I might not want to disclose that I don't know how to do it. I might think, am I good enough to be here? Maybe it's me who is stupid since I don't know what to do. And there is a risk that that person is getting stuck and just sitting and looking at the screen for 10 hours without actually moving on. So it's really important to have a culture on the team where you can ask the, the more experienced team member and saying, I'm lost here, could you help me? And it's important to have a culture where the 22 or 23 year old is willing to help and able to help without saying, you should know this already, or this is simple to do, but, but helping in a good spirit. And this way of working together, I think any IT development company can benefit from that as well. And I think this is also what you can train when you're doing the, the CTF and when you're working together in smaller teams during the CTF, you also train this way of working together. It's not only about asking for help, it's actually also offering help when someone is lost. Um, yeah. Um, so I think that when Denmark won the European Cybersecurity Challenge in 2022, it was, of course, about having the best technical competence. It's about having a strong, strong team. But it's also about the team building. And here, I found that CTF is really good because it's like we discussed, it's motivating because you can get people to do anything when you, get, when you give them points. Um, it's uh, gamified. It's actually quite fun. Uh, I hope you also got just a little bit feel of it with the demonstration that you're thinking, hmm, how could we actually do that? There were also people suggesting maybe you could solve this in a different way. So it's, it's a fun way of working. It's hands-on. Uh, I think that people remember much better when, they, when it's not only something they read about, but it's actually something they did. If I want people to learn about cookies, 
Like even if I want high school students to learn about cookies, they would say, yeah, I know what a cookie is because I saw the cookie banner. But do you know how it actually works? Do you know what kind of information is stored? Do you know that you can change the information? This is knowledge you get once you have sit, it, sit with your hands in it and you don't forget it again as easily as if it was just something you heard about. And it's the creativity and the creative mindset. And some people think that hacking is about programming, okay? You might do things faster when you can write a script, but it's really about the creative mindset of it, that you're trying something, it doesn't work, and you're trying something else, and then you're trying something else. And that creativity is also what you are, what you're training here. Um, I think it can be integrated into teaching in so many settings, but I also think that there is a big difference in how you use CTF for a competition, where essentially you are not allowed to help participants because then it's an unfair competition. And if it is a learning environment where you can help and give hints and help along the way. So I think that if you're designing it, if you are considering using CTF in your workplace, then think carefully if it's a competition or a learning setting or something in between. Um, yeah. And again, I don't think I don't think the strength is really that you just are doing CTF. I think the strength is when you integrate it into learning some theory, you get your hands on it, and you have this discussion of how to avoid vulnerabilities, for example. Um, I very much believe that we should design challenges for learning and progression. Again, the difference between making challenges which are cool because they are difficult because you know you need to use a lot of different tools in order to solve it. But if I go to a class and I say, okay, now you need to learn eight different tools and eight different methods. And when you combine them, you will be able to solve this challenge. Then it will be extremely hard. But if I build a progression around it, so I have some challenges where I learn one tool. I have some challenges where I learn another tool. I have some challenges where I learn a third tool and divide it like that and build it up like a ladder. Then, then you can finish off with the complex after a complex challenge at the end, but it requires that you do a careful learning design in the way that you create the challenges. Um, and then I think that we also need to develop new categories. Traditionally, CTF has been something very, very technical. And I think that we can do a lot by making also less technical challenges um, in order to close the cybersecurity skills gap better so we can attract a wider audience uh, to cybersecurity. And that's what we have been trying, for example, with the, with the social media challenges, that it's something that a lot of people can relate to. And it's really an eye-opener. Whoa, can you do that? And for you, it might be common knowledge that if you share a boarding pass on social media and you remove the, your name, you think you will be safe. But if you leave the barcode, every information will be there. And just small eye-openers like that is really a, a good step into security. And when people start doing small things, they get curious, they want to do more, and then you can also start feeding them something that is that is a bit more technical without scaring them away. So uh, this idea about building it up in, in a clear progression and with small steps works really, really well in my experience. <laughs>